Hello, thank you for tuning in today for our live stream session recording. So today's session is being presented by the Podiatry and Foot Care Service with Hunter New England Local Health District and is being facilitated by Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. And this is part of the Diabetes Alliance. So my name is Charles Broadfoot and I'm a Professional Development Officer with the PHN. And I would firstly like to acknowledge the First Peoples and traditional custodians on the land that we're meeting on today and from where you're watching the recording today. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So uh, this recording sits alongside other recordings on our PHN website. So if you head to our website, thephn.com.au and click on the education tab, we have all our upcoming events um, and all our recordings uh, that we keep on there. So it's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenting podiatrist. So we'll have Bronwyn Hardy and Simon Bean. So I'll hand over to you. Hello, I'd just like to talk to you today about um, some statistics relating to diabetes to begin with and the foot complications that can go with diabetes. Diabetic foot complications are the single most common cause of non-traumatic lower limb amputations in the industrialised world. And as many as 75% of amputations due to diabetes could be prevented by appropriate foot care. We know that every 20 seconds somewhere in the world, someone loses a leg due to diabetic complications. We know Indigenous Australians are 38 times more likely to have a major amputation than non-Indigenous Australians. And we know that 50% of patients who lose their legs will be dead within five years. So what are the primary effects of diabetes on the feet? Well, there are two key factors that contribute to diabetic foot complications. One is reduced nerve conduction and the other is reduced peripheral perfusion. So we're looking at loss of sensation, uh, less vasoconstriction, numbness in the feet, um, calcification, tissue damage, and at worst case scenario, gangrene and amputation. So the secondary effects of diabetes on the feet are things like obesity, edema, reduced peripheral perfusion, reduced activity. And so this relates to um, reduced blood glucose level control, uh, sedentary risk factors, and atherosclerosis. Lifestyle is also a big secondary effect of diabetes um, on the feet. So things like smoking, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, suboptimal blood glucose levels. People who are low income earners, um, we know have bigger problems with their feet and footwear, which we'll talk at some length about later. So who can check their feet? Well, the answer to this is pretty much anybody. It doesn't have to be a podiatrist. We want the patients themselves to be checking their feet on a regular basis. If they can't, we want their carers to be doing it. We can have other health professionals um, checking feet. You can do it every time a patient walks into your practice. Uh, we have a photo here of um, some very neglected feet and this can be a consequence of what happens when people can't self-care and when there is nobody else to, to help them care for their feet. And these are the sorts of problems that we're trying to prevent so that the patients don't develop bigger complications again. When we're checking our feet, what are we looking for? Essentially, we're checking for anything that's not normal for that person. We also want them to check their shoes on a regular basis, and that means the outside of the shoe, but also the inside of the shoe. There are plenty of um, foreign objects that can be found in shoes, and as well as that, the actual interior of the shoe can start to deteriorate over time, and that can lead to problems. What else are we looking for? Well, anything on the skin that shouldn't be there, wasn't there yesterday, that sort of thing. So corns, callus, tinea, warts, foreign objects touching the skin, those sorts of things. So what's wrong with callus? I'm not sure if you're aware of the difference between a corn and a callus, um, but these both develop over areas of high pressure in cases of peripheral neuropathy, these lesions are not painful and they can uh, lead to ulceration of the tissues underneath. So there are a few simple checks that anybody can do. We will talk about this in greater detail later, but we want to be checking for patients' pulses and their uh, sensation, their lack of or their um, ability to feel things, uh, because these are two of the major risk factors 
for complications for, from diabetes. We want to be asking patients about their feet. I want to know, do they do daily foot checks? Do they notice a funny smell about their feet? What's the skin condition like? Do they have sores or, or other lesions on their feet? And what's their daily hygiene process like? Do they wash their feet, dry their feet, moisturise their feet on a regular basis? So what's so important about a diabetic foot check? Well, 60 to 70% of people with diabetes will develop neuropathy at some point, and 25% of people with diabetes will develop a foot ulcer. And one in five foot ulcers will require amputation, whether it's a minor amputation or a major amputation. So some of the diabetic foot complications that we see include things like peripheral vascular disease, neuropathy in the form of sensory neuropathy, motor neuropathy and autonomic neuropathy, and we'll talk about this a little bit further in a little while, diabetic foot ulcers, and a condition known as Charcot neuroarthropathy, which we will again talk about shortly. So peripheral vascular disease is a decrease in perfusion to the feet. It means that there's a decrease in oxygen, nutrients, inflammatory response markers, chemical mediators for wound healing and repair, immunity and antibiotics. There's a decrease in tissue resilience, which results in a greater risk of tissue destruction from both internal and external forces. And then there is delayed wound healing. Reports from the US, the UK and Finland all confirm that PVD is a major contributing factor in the pathogenesis of foot ulceration and then subsequent foot amputations. Now I just want to show you a picture here of what an ischemic wound looks like. So they are very painful. They often occur around the border of the foot, the apex or the tips of the toes and the top of the foot. They can also occur between the toes where the toes rub together. And they're usually surrounded by dry and shiny skin. So moving on now to neuropathy, this is a loss of nerve function and control. And there are three types of neuropathy. Sensory neuropathy is um, feeling, the sensation of pain, pressure and temperature. Motor neuropathy relates to muscle strength and control. And then autonomic neuropathy relates to things like bladder function and sweat gland regu regulation, which can affect the feet. So sensory neuropathy, patients might know the term numbness or neuropathy. Basically what's happening is the nerves, nerves absorb excess glucose, which prevents the transmission of the nerve signal. So there's a loss of protective sensation and this can actually lead to a disassociation of limbs. People are not aware that their limbs are still at the bottom of their feet or the bottom of their body um, because they can't feel them anymore. Motor neuropathy is where there's a muscular imbalance within the feet. So the intrinsic muscles, the very small muscles within the feet, um, if these become um, affected, it can lead to toe deformity, so clawed toes. It can result in joint stiffness at the ankle and this then increases pressures underneath the forefoot. And balance can be altered due to a reduction in proprioception and then pressure areas start to develop because of the change in the way people walk. Autonomic neuropathy relates to things like dry skin and in the diabetic population this is extremely common. It's associated with reduced sweat gland regulation and the problem with this is that dry skin is weak skin and so we can end up with cracks and um, ulcers leading from that. Autonomic neuropathy also results in arteriovenous shunting, which means there's a decrease in oxygen and nutrients getting to the tissues, and vasodilation, leading to increased perfusion and Charcot joints. Now we talked a little bit before about what an ischemic wound looks like. This is a neuropathic wound. These, by contrast, are painless. They occur over areas where there is high pressure and they are surrounded by hyperkeratosis or callus, which is what this yellow material is around the skin. So what does neuropathy mean for our patients? Well, they must check their feet daily. Foot feeling is no longer reliable, so other senses have to be used. So they need to look at their feet and their shoes. They need to touch their feet with their hands to look at the top of their foot and the bottom of the foot. 
and they're looking for anything that is not normal, normal for them. This is just showing a little bit of humour in what we do in podiatry, but this is looking at um, the fact that there are other things than just skin uh, deformities that can cause problems. Um, there are all sorts of things that can end up in people's shoes. And for people that don't have sensation, that can lead to long-term problems of um, skin breakdown, ulceration and potentially amputation. So I just want to briefly look at the etiology of foot wounds. There are primary factors and secondary factors. So we've talked a little bit about the primary factors, uh, peripheral neuropathy and peripheral vascular disease. Some of the secondary factors include things like limited joint mobility, bony deformity, trauma, and a decreased immune response. And here we have some pictures of some typical diabetic foot ulcers that we see in clinic. Um, there are some here, that are, there's one here with a piece of glass that's been removed from the foot, so you can see that there's a foreign object there that's caused the problem. A necrotic plug caused because there's not enough vascular supply to the foot. A claw toe, a deformity caused by um, motor neuropathy and the intrinsic muscles not working properly to keep those toes flat. And then a charco foot that we will talk about again shortly. So when we're assessing wounds, we need to know uh, what's causing them. You know, are they neuropathic? Are they ischemic? Are they a mixed ulcer? Is there a bit of both causing this, this problem? We then need to assess to see whether there's any infection in this ulcer and at what level. Is it a local infection? Is it a cellulitic type infection? Or is it a deep osteomyelitis? To be able to determine this, there are several, extra, uh, several investigations that we need to use, including things like x-rays, wound swabs, um, some more um, investigative tools that we use might be things like bone scans or MRIs, depending on what the presentation is. And then depending on what we find with the wound, we will refer off to the appropriate person, um, appropriate clinic, if we see that there's other input that could be gained. For example, a vascular consultant, if this is a vascular wound. When treating a diabetic foot wound, as a podiatrist, there's um, several things we can offer. Um, debridement is certainly one um, option. There's different types of debridement available depending on the type of wound that's presenting. Um, podiatrists are typically known for conservative sharp debridement, but dressings that we provide can do a lot of debriding. Um, infection management, edema management, surgery might be required to be able to realign the foot to help wounds heal. Certainly education is a big factor. As podiatrists, we're very much involved in offloading diabetic foot wounds. Um, there are several types of offloading available that we can use, and we'll talk about these shortly. Now, I just want to talk briefly about a Charcot neuroarthropathy. Um, a lot of people have not heard of this condition because it is a very rare complication of diabetes, but in the high-risk foot clinic, we see it quite a lot. It's also known as a Charcot foot. It's basically happening when, um, in the presence of neuropathy, um, when there's good blood flow, and these are combined, people can't feel changes that are happening in their feet. It is frequently misdiagnosed. You can see by this picture that you have one foot that's very red and very swollen compared to the other foot, and it's often mistaken for an infection. It should always be considered when a patient presents with a unilateral red hot swollen foot. This is another picture of a Charcot. I know it's not a very good picture, but it shows you the deformity that can occur when a Charcot foot is left untreated. The suggested etiology of a Charcot foot is that autonomic neuropathy increases blood flow to the foot, which results in softening of the bones. Motor neuropathy means that there's a muscle imbalance, and sensory neuropathy means that the patient's not aware of the bony destruction that's happening, and so they continue to walk on it and continue to cause the foot to deteriorate. These are some pictures that we have that just show the deformity that you'll find in a Charcot foot, but they also show the significance of, um, or the seriousness of ulcers that can occur when somebody has a bony deformity due to Charcot. So when we're assessing a Charcot foot, we need to, again, look at the different aspects of it. We need to know what the etiology is. Um, there will be neuropathy. 
Is there an injury? Sometimes a Charcot foot can occur with no injury at all, no specific trauma. Sometimes a patient will, will know that there's been a particular trauma that's happened. Sometimes it can just occur when there's normal activity. Is there infection? It's unlikely um, to be cellulitis if it fails to respond to antibiotic treatment. There may be a wound present, as we talked about. We will do several investigations, but the clinical presentation of a red hot swollen foot, X-ray and temperatures usually will confirm a diagnosis of a Charcot foot. And if a Charcot foot is found um, to be present, then an immediate referral to a high-risk foot clinic, endocrinologist, orthopaedic consultant, um, a multidisciplinary clinic is advised. So this just shows you some X-rays of what a Charcot neuroarthropathy looks like. This shows this person's foot um, taken a normal x-ray in 2012. You can see joint spaces in the middle of the foot, whereas if you look at the film on the right, those joint spaces have all been very much um, destroyed. The foot basically just looks like one big mess of bone. That's three years, 2012 to 2015. On the lateral view of the x-ray, you can actually see a very common sign of a Charcot foot, and that's a rocker bottom midfoot. And so you can see that those bones in the middle of the foot are starting to rock a bottom or, or dip down um, where they shouldn't be sitting. How do we treat a Charcot foot? Well, prompt diagnosis is the key thing. We need to get these people off their foot because the more they walk around on a Charcot foot, the worse it's going to get. So immobilisation is our primary goal in the initial stages. We need to be able to make a list of potential differential diagnoses and things that you might consider would be infection, tendon rupture, cellulitis, gout, septic arthritis, all these sorts of things. But um, as I said, early immobilisation is so important. So even if a, a true diagnosis hasn't been made, immobilisation is very, very important. When patients come to us with a Charcot, we um, implement different treatment mo modalities to be able to ensure that immobilisation is happening. First one and the gold standard is a total contact cast. This is a plaster cast or a fibreglass cast that's applied to the foot. Um, it's not removable and it means that people are not been able to take it off and walk on their foot. We have some other options. There's a boot at the moment um, that we're using called a Vacaped. There's a cam boot. These are both removable, although they can be made to be non-removable, um, which shows that they have, um, they are just as effective as a total contact cast. Obviously, if a patient can be non-weight bearing, that is much, much better for their um, outcome. So use of a wheelchair, crutches, having them bed bound, all these things helps to take weight bearing pressures off the foot. Surgery can be an option for these people if the deformity um, is severe. Surgery would only be performed in the chronic or the cold stage of the, the disease process. And obviously there are risks and benefits that need to be addressed um, before a patient would proceed with surgery. Now there's a few offloading options that we can use for both Charcot and for wounds, and I've touched a little bit on them. Um, as well as the total contact cast and the removable cast walkers, we have at our disposal things like post-op shoes or boots, um, orthoses that can be used with or without um, medical grade or custom shoes. Um, stock shoes can be used uh, depending on the level of deformity that people have. Felt padding is a great offloading modality that we use and we often use felt in combination with some of these other um, offloading devices. We can pad different shoes in different ways to take pressures, reduce pressures. Now footwear is a question that all podiatrists get asked about a lot and we basically recommend that all footwear should have the following features. They should have some sort of fastening they should have a firm heel counter. They should have a heel height of less than two centimetres, a firm sole, a wide and deep toe box. They should be one thumb's width from the longest toe to the end of the shoe, and preferably leather upper and lining to help with breathability. I've got my colleague Simon here and he's going to talk to you a little bit in depth shortly about um, footwear 
but those are some features that we like to talk about on a regular basis. Um, the other, a couple of tips for you about shoes is that it's really important to have your feet measured professionally and to find out if your local shoe store trains their staff in how to um, measure feet. There's a little graphic here that um, it seems quite humorous, but it's actually got a very serious side to it. It says, good news, I've discovered the source of your problem. Your feet haven't been a size five and a half since you were in the sixth grade. And I find this very true, actually, that a lot of people do not get their feet measured every time they go and buy shoes. They just keep wearing the same size over and over. And people's feet do change size um, as they age and through different medical conditions. Some more tips for buying shoes for yourselves and your patients. Make sure that when you're purchasing shoes, you purchase late in the day because that's when your feet are at their most swollen, their biggest. So if your shoes fit then, they will fit first thing in the morning. Always fit your larger foot. We all have one foot that's slightly bigger than the other, so make sure you know which foot is your larger foot and fit to that. And please be aware that price does not indicate a better fit. There is nothing to say that a $50 pair of shoes is any worse off for you than a $300 pair of shoes. So please make sure that you're being fitted properly. You're not just buying a shoe because it's expensive or you've been told that it's the best shoe for your foot. Now, when we do a diabetes screening, we're essentially screening to identify the risk factors that put that diabetic foot at risk of complications. So we've talked before about peripheral neuropathy and peripheral vascular disease being two of the major risk factors for complications. The other things we need to think about are dermatological conditions. So anything that's on the skin that shouldn't be there or is not normally there. Abnormal lower limb biomechanics. So by this I mean any sort of deformity in the foot, anything that makes the foot look like it's got a prominence that shouldn't be there because this will then cause a rub or a pressure area that can then break down inappropriate footwear, and poor self-care. People need to be able to look after their feet if they're going to prevent foot problems. Now, the frequency of a diabetes foot screening does depend on the level of risk, and the International Working Group for the Diabetic Foot recommends that that risk level is, um, any foot, feet should be assessed anywhere between six and 12 monthly, depending on the level of risk. So the more high risk a foot is, and by that we mean if they have a presence of peripheral vascular disease or peripheral neuropathy, then they should be assessed more regularly every 12 months, if they are, every, sorry, every six months. Um, and if they are um, a lower risk, they can have their assessment stretched out to every 12 months. So when you're doing a screening in your clinic, there are a few things that um, you can be asking your patient. You want to ask them first, do they have any neuropathic symptoms? Do they have any vascular symptoms? Have they had previous amputation? Before you even get to the level of amputation, have they had previous ulceration? Have they had pre previous problems with their feet? So they can tell you a little bit about their history. Then it's really important to look at your patient's feet. Take their shoes off on your treatment bed and have a look at their feet. What are you looking for? Well, you want to look for the obvious. You want to look for infection, ulceration, corns and callus, any sort of nail problem, an ingrown toenail or a, you know, a broken or a damaged nail. Tinea, breaks to the skin, deformity, anything that you consider to be not normal for that foot. So what is it about corns and callus? I'm just going to go back to this because this is really important. These must be regarded as pre-ulcerative in the neuropathic foot. People cannot feel areas of high pressure and the skin can break down. They generally appear as areas of hard yellow skin. Callus tends to be more diffuse over the areas of the foot, so the ball of the foot or the heel, whereas corns tend to be a more specific location like the tip of a toe or the, um, the side of the little toe. Early treatment of these is really important in a diabetic foot because if not, they can break down. So we're just gonna have a look at Simon's feet now. He's gonna act as my patient for me. We're going to look when we're doing a diabetic screening of how we look for foot pulses. So 
you've got two pulses in the feet. You've got one that runs down the top of the foot, which is the dorsalis pedis pulse. This is actually absent in about 10% of the population. So it's important to know if you can't find it, then you've got another pulse that you can look for. The second pulse is, runs down the inside of the foot and under the ankle bone, and that's called the posterior tibial pulse. And I find a really good way to find this is just to run your fingers over the bone and then tuck in underneath. It's actually hidden away behind a few other structures, so it's pretty important that you press with a reasonable amount of pressure so that you're actually finding it. When you're looking for the dorsalis pedis pulse, you just run your fingers over the top of the foot and you move side to side until you can find that pulse. Now, for those of you that might be lucky enough to have a Doppler in your clinic, this is something that you can use um, as a next stage, if you like, to find a pulse. Um, you're pointing the Doppler probe towards the body so that you're, um, you're assessing the, the blood cells as they come down from the heart, down to the extremity. And you're just going to move it across the foot until you can find it. Again, in the um, posterior tibial, you just want to angle it into the... Um, the fossa in the foot, basically. Now, you will need some Doppler gel to do this. I have been asked before whether you can use an obstetric or a fetal um, probe. They don't work as well because the probe is slightly different, but they can... Um, they're not going to work terribly effectively on the foot, so you're probably better... If you're wanting to do pulses, you probably need to get a, um, an ultrasound machine that will work for pedal pulses. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is neuropathy. Now, this is going to assess um, sensory nerve function and a loss of protective sensation. Now, this is a monofilament. These are a standard in instrument tool that are, is readily available these days. Um, you can have single-use monofilaments, but these do, ne do need to be used as single-use only. If you have one that can be reused again, it just needs to be cleaned off after each use. Now, the way that we do use the monofilament these days is we're testing three locations on the foot. We're testing the base of the big toe, the first metatarsal joint, and the fifth metatarsal joint. And what we've found is that if patients can't detect the monofilament in these locations, they won't be able to detect it anywhere else, and it is not standardised... Um, not, sorry, not validated to be proven to be effective. So when I touch a monofilament to my patient's foot, I'm just applying a light pressure, just enough to bend the monofilament, and then I'm taking it off. I'm not tapping it time and time again, because that's not going to tell me any more information. What I will do is I'm going to ask my patient, Simon, would you mind closing your eyes, please? And tell me when you can feel my monofilament. Yes. 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 So Simon's felt three out of the three locations that I've touched, so I'm confident that I can say that he is sensate. He has sensation and he can feel... This is equivalent of 10 grams of pressure, so he will feel 10 grams of pressure. I might actually hand over to Simon now because I want him to talk to you a little bit about footwear and the um, appropriateness of different shoes and different features of shoes. Howdy, everyone. So Bron's talked through a little bit about how to get yourself some good new footwear. I'll have a bit of a chat about how you can assess footwear yourselves when a patient comes into the clinic room. Best thing you can do straight away is when they come in, if you're at all concerned about it, is get the patient standing up and having a feel of the foot within the shoe. So checking at the end of the shoe, if they've got that thumbnail width from the longest toe to the end of the shoe. Now, often people's second toes are longer. Often some of these patients may have had amputation, so it's important to check where the longest toe is, not where you think the big toe should be. The next thing you should be checking is the depth of the shoe. So having a look at the foot within the shoe, often a lot of these patients have these very high clawed toes, and you'll be able to see it through the top of the shoe um, and that's a concern that the shoes aren't deep enough as well so you don't really want to be seeing any of those those signs of the toes through the top of the shoe um, you should also be checking the width of the shoe as well when they're standing and you can just have a simple squeeze and feel of that if you're seeing toes overriding this part of the shoe in the midsole there you know they're definitely not wide enough now that goes in part with the material of the shoes. Um, leather is really good, as, as Bron said. 
Um, a lot of these days, the shoes are these mesh material. They're also quite good. Most of the decent brands, um, you big brands have seamless uppers, which is also really, really good, but so do some of your cheaper ones, as Bron said. They can be really, really good as well. The other things, like Bron indicated, is to check the shoe, is to check if it's got a nice, firm, hard heel on the back, and you can do that by pushing the shoe and giving it a good push. Most shoes with the support the foot well, you won't be able to move that heel down at all. You want to check the base of the shoe as well and make sure you can't twist it too much because um, that's going to support the foot a lot and reduce the risk of getting any of those shearing forces or blisters or anything like that through the rest of the shoe. Most shoes should bend through the front nicely through where that big toe joint is to allow them to push off and that's all pretty normal. That's the most important things you can really do with footwear, quite easy checks to do. I'll pass back to Bron now. So moving on in the diabetic screen, foot screening, the next thing we want to know, uh, we want to educate the patient. We want to know, um, do they understand the effect that diabetes is having on their feet? Can they identify appropriate foot, foot care practices for themselves? Do they understand the importance of moisturising on a daily basis or, um, you know, having dry skin removed? There's various ways to remove dry skin and patients themselves should be um, filing, pumicing, moisturising on a regular basis, provided they've got the sensation to be able to do this safely. We basically want to know are their feet adequately cared for and if they're not, what processes or steps are in place to make sure that they're getting adequate foot care. We also want to know that they've got the ability to self-care. Now, a lot of our patients have vision impairment. They can't see their feet to begin with. They can't see if there's a bit of blood on the, on the carpet or on their foot. Um, they have trouble reaching their feet because as we get older, we can you know, develop problems with our flexibility and our mobility. Uh, so we need to be able to make sure that they can still get down there to look after their feet. We need to know that they've got the um, cognitive ability to understand why they're doing it and how they're doing it, how they're caring for their feet but also a safety issue. We need to make sure that patients aren't going to fall over because they're trying to care for their feet. They're bending forward to put cream on their feet and they're toppling out of a chair or they're falling over while they're doing this in the shower because they're slipping over. So these are lots of different um, self-care factors that we need to take into consideration and really ask the patient when we're doing their screening. So what do you do when you have a patient that presents to you with a diabetic foot complication? Well, the first thing I would be suggesting is um, undertake a diabetes foot assessment and go through all these steps that we've just talked about. The second thing is if you need to speak to somebody at the high risk foot clinic, you can certainly contact us at any time um, and have a quick chat. We're more than happy to talk to people. If you feel that a patient needs a referral to the high risk foot clinic, then they need a referral from the GP through the Referral Information Centre. Um, I guess basically if there's one piece of foot specific advice that you could give your patients, it would be to check their feet every single day. I can't express the importance of this enough. If patients are checking their feet every single day, they won't have an injury or a, a problem that's any more than 24 hours old. So they're getting on top of it immediately. And if there's one foot specific addition that you can make to your patient consultation, it would be ask your patients to take their shoes off, both their shoes and their socks, sit up on your treatment chair or bed and look at their feet. Because occasionally there's going to be that patient that won't or can't check their feet themselves. And if you're doing it for them, then at least you might be able to identify a problem. Our main goal is to keep all of our patients on their feet. We want to prevent problems and stop things from deteriorating. So that's all I wanted to talk to you about today. I'm going to hand back to Charles now. Thanks for listening to us. Wonderful, thank you. Big thanks to Bronwyn and Simon for generously giving your time this afternoon and also for hosting us in your clinic. So if you have any questions, comments or feedback, you can send them through to education at thephn.com.au. Thanks again for watching today's recording and we hope you have a great day.